Hello, I'm Brendan Donnelly. I'm the director of the Federal Trust, a pro-European think tank based in London. I shall be discussing today with the uh, chairman of the Federal Trust, John Stevens, a former member of the European Parliament, the state of the Brexit negotiations or the post-Brexit relations between the EU and the UK. Uh, the Federal Trust uh, has got a website, um, fedtrust.co.uk, where there's a lot of interesting material. If you find our discussion today interesting, um, you might well like to consult further on our website. Um, but I'll begin by welcoming John and um, asking him whether he thinks uh, it was inevitable that there would be this present scratchy, tetchy relationship between the EU and the UK two months after the tra trade and cooperation agreement. It was generally recognized that this was a skeleton agreement and people hoped that there would be an opportunity to develop something more constructive and pragmatic on the basis of it. Um, that hasn't really happened, um, not least perhaps because now we've had to say um, hello, good evening and welcome to David Frost, Mark II. Um, do you think that things will get better or, or are they condemned at least to remain as bad as they are? I fear things are likely to get worse because the underlying logic of Brexit has been to have an antagonistic relationship with the continent and with the EU in particular, and to try and give Britain an entirely different identity and uh, orientation. And given that, um, and the political forces that formed that, a continuing tension between London and Brussels in particular is inevitable, is actually necessary. I think there's also a, an electoral element to it, that the Conservative Party thinks it stumbled upon a, an electoral coalition of its traditional supporters, and if you like, the dispossessed who can be kept in an excite, uh, state of excited dispossessedness um, by blaming Europe. Um, after all, it was a, an important um, part of the, uh, of the um, Leave campaign to say that Europeans are taking your jobs. You are dispossessed by Europeans. And it's important, I think, for the future uh, electoral prospects of the Conservative Party that it should maintain this coalition which well, you'd only need 42 or 43% to be able to win a, a majority under our, our first past the post system uh, by keeping at fever pitch, or at least um, always keeping at a certain pitch, um, the tension between the UK and the EU. That's exactly uh, right. However, there is a weakness in that uh, electoral coalition, which is that the Conservative Party risks losing what was a very key part of its, its support in the Southeast and in London, linked to particularly the financial services industry in the city of London and the prosperity that flowed from that. And the question is whether uh, the continuing antagonism of the Brexit process and therefore the damage which is done to those economic interests uh, ultimately undermines the Conservative position. The Conservative Party cannot simply be a northern party of economic losers, essentially. Um, it was able to combine both complacency in the southeast and a sense of victimhood in the north, quite a lot of it justified, um, into a successful coalition. But ultimately, there is a great contradiction between those two interest groups. Why do you think the um, British government was so badly prepared for the, for the me mechanics of, of Brexit? Um, we, we see that they may be wanting further grace periods, both in Northern Ireland uh, and, and for, for British imp for imports from the, from the continent. Um, was, uh, was that just incompetent or, or was there some uh, political calculation behind it? Well, I'm not sure it was a calculation, but I think there was certainly a political tension. And until a very late stage, I think the option of leaving with no deal for a range of reasons was seriously under consideration. And honestly, if you are contemplating no deal, uh, detail on what 
a deal might be can easily suffer. Uh, yes, I, but I think there was the opposite fear or the opposite hope um, that it would be possible to get so favourable an arrangement with the uh, with the European Union um, that many of these supposed um, um, barriers and bureaucratic formalities wouldn't take place. It, it, uh, it was a, an over optimistic view which then also needed to be put across to the electorate because admitting how bad Brexit was going to be was not something that fitted in with the conservative narrative until, until very, very recently. I think that's certainly presentationally true, but I think the disregard that um, the British government showed towards some very, very critical questions, um, the City of London and Northern Ireland being the two most obvious examples, um, can only really be explicable on the basis that um, they were really contemplating doing uh, Brexit regardless of the terms of an arrangement. They were, it was a, a willful disregard of the facts of the case um, in, in both instances. And I, I can't believe that this was based on ignorance. Um, I mean, it was based on, on a range of misassessments about the prospects that um, the city might have outside uh, the EU and outside uh, Euro-denominated business and the rest. And I think it was based on a presumption, which after all has a very long history, that ultimately the Irish um, can be browbeaten into accepting uh, whatever agenda is ultimately set in London. I'd like to talk about Ireland later, but um, when, how long do you think it will take uh, for opinion, public opinion, to, to focus on uh, on the day-to-day -day problems of, of Brexit and in a way that may shift public perceptions. Um, after all, the government has been greatly helped, the um, uh, country has been, been greatly harmed, but the government in its presentation has been helped by being able to blame the pandemic for many of the problems that are in fact the problems of Brexit. How, how do you see that as sorting itself out over the next couple of months? Well, I think the next couple of months is a, is a fairly short time scale for this. I, the shadow of the pandemic is going to be a long one. The crucial question really is <clears throat> how the global economy recovers from COVID over what time scale and how that impacts on the UK, because um, that's the context in which the economic problems inherent to Brexit, the fact that we have... Um, done immense damage to our major trading relationship, that we have done immense damage to our principal export industry. Um, that, that will be dictated by the shape of the global recovery. Um, how fast it comes, uh, whether it brings with it a lot of inflation, how quickly uh, the debt that has been built up as a result of COVID, but which is already very high before the COVID crisis, um, how that impacts and that is going to be um, a, a question of um, certainly several months and, and probably well into next year. You, you mentioned Ireland and um, suggested that part of the British government's thinking um, was that it was always going to be possible to browbeat the Irish into accepting um, uh, terms which were favourable to the United Kingdom uh, relating to the external border um, of the EU, which runs through, which would run or might run through the island of, of, of Ireland. Um, I think it's possible that that's a mistaken assessment. It's very clear that the Irish government doesn't want to have to choose um, between um, uh, a good relationship with the United Kingdom and remaining in solidarity with the rest of the European Union. But if they are forced to choose, are they not going to choose the EU? for political and sovereignty related reasons? I'm sure they are. And they cannot under any circumstances uh, afford to go along with a, a border imposed across the island of Ireland. Um, but the current Irish government and the um, Dublin establishment are under tremendous pressure from Sinn Féin. And the real danger that um, they fear is that Sinn Féin will be the big winner from this crisis 
both in the south and in the north. Uh, the critical factor is one of, of timing again, as so often. I think uh, Brexit has not only revived uh, talk of a united Ireland, which was virtually um, uh, sleeping before uh, 2016, um, it has accelerated pressure for clarification on, in particular, when a, a border poll might take place and under what circumstances. And here there is a further uh, timing consideration, which I think is of growing importance in people's perceptions, which is that President Biden, who is clearly a perceived to be, correctly, I think, a, a pro-Irish figure, may only be a one-term president. And the American participation in any process of uh, clarifying the issue of a border poll and its timing and context and conditions um, will mean that a desire to have clarification in all of this is going to be brought forward. And I expect uh, the current crisis, which is emerging over the protocol, is only going to get worse and um, will intensify over the next a year or so to a position where I think uh, there will certainly be a serious attempt by the Americans, by the EU, by Dublin, to um, come to an agreement uh, for a package on, on the issue of unification or not, or how it might occur, which would be presented to London. But isn't there a paradox here? Um, while many people um, in the, on the mainland uh, are relatively indifferent to the fate of Northern Ireland, um, it's part of the conservative narrative that it doesn't allow itself to be pushed around by foreigners. Uh, I think it would be quite difficult for the Johnson government um, to be seen to be carrying out the bidding of Dublin and, and Washington in this context. Um, on the contrary, um, being seen to stand up to these foreigners who don't know enough about um, Northern Ireland um, to be able to form a judgment um, might be quite an electorally attractive proposition for this government. Well, there's no question that part of the current um, heat over uh, the protocol is uh, linked to the broader agenda of creating a sense of uh, uh, grievance and uh, ongoing confrontation with the European Union. But underlying this is a different consideration. I think that uh, a majority in the Conservative Party now would be perfectly happy to get shot of Northern Ireland. Um, Johnson, beneath the surface, had no opposition at all to the proposition of dropping the Unionists um, in it in order to secure Brexit. And what I think uh, is the real uh, constraint upon the British government's position vis-a-vis -vis Ireland is the fears that concessions in Ireland, and in particular moves towards uh, unification, um, timing for a border poll, things of that sort, uh, would exacerbate the pressure for independence in Scotland. And it is Scottish independence um, which is the real fear for London, because I think they recognise that um, losing Northern Ireland might be seen as a, a positive by the vast majority of people in, in Britain, um, but losing Scotland would make any claim that Brexit has been a success utterly ludicrous. I make one um, final point about Ireland before we go to talk about Scotland. Um, Jacob Rees-Mogg has, has said some quite remarkable things recently, um, uh, quoting um, satirically and in a way that he disagreed with um, the proposition, which was Peter Brook's proposition, that uh, the United Kingdom has no selfish or strategic interest in, in Northern Ireland. Uh, on the contrary, he said, um, we, we are not neutral uh, as between the propositions of a united Ireland and um, uh, Northern Ireland remaining within the United Kingdom. We have an interest in Northern Ireland's remaining within the United Kingdom. Now, well, the, the, I don't know if he fully realised how provocative these utterances are, um, but they couldn't really be more provocative from the point of view of, of any kind of moderate nationalism. I agree entirely, and that was an extraordinarily provocative set of remarks. And it wasn't just Peter Brook's observation, it was also inherent in um, all the preliminary discussions that led to the Good Friday Agreement. 
In fact, it was absolutely fundamental to the Good Friday Agreement. Uh, so, but I incline to think that Rees Mogg is here uh, um, an outlying figure in, well, in this respect and perhaps in many others. Um, but he has not, as you say, been slapped down in any way. Um, but the, the reality is, is nevertheless that the, the British government would not be unduly concerned if there was a way of losing Northern Ireland. Um, and they would believe actually there could be considerable benefits from that, not just financial, but also in terms of image. I mean, it's been an ongoing problem with the Americans and it is now a problem with the Europeans. Scotland is what really concerns them. Yeah, but isn't there a, a parallel um, uh, contradiction between uh, national interests, which you point to, to um, the plausibility of Brexit, which would be undermined by, by Scotland's um, leaving the Union, um, and the fact that the Conservative Party has a, has a considerable inter uh, electoral interest in presenting itself as the one unionist party in Scotland, which will give it 10, 12, 15 seats, uh, and saying um, that it is to the its English voters um, the party that is not going to allow these um, feckless and unreliable Scots to break up the precious union. I think having a row with Scottish Union, with Scottish National, Scottish National Party, which um, Boris Johnson always calls, of course, the Scottish Nationalist Party, incorrectly, um, is uh, electorate rather attractive for this Conservative Party. And electoral consider considerations, it seems to me, are all the way with this present Conservative Party. Well, certainly, I mean, th there's absolutely no question that the government is determined to defeat Scottish nationalism and wishes to um, uh, prevent at all costs Scottish independence because they know that it would be absolutely fatal uh, to, well, not just to conservatism in, in England, but also to Brexit. Um, and if, more specifically, and this is also why the relevance of a border pole in Ireland um, comes up, any granting of another referendum on Scottish independence would immediately undermine the legitimacy um, of the 2016 European referendum. Um, it would allow um, people to contemplate a replaying of that in a relatively short order. So Scotland is the, is the crucial issue. Uh, whether the government is going about um, keeping Scotland in the Union and whether that is actually an attainable objective is, um, is a different matter. Even more extraordinary has been the surge in support for, for Welsh independence, um, which was something very dormant until recently. For many Brexiters, of course, it's worth giving up the whole world for Brexit. So giving up Wales, I think, would be something they'd be, they wouldn't be too bothered <laughs> about. Um, but Mark Greatford made an interesting remark the other day in which he said that he thought that the devolution settlement within the United Kingdom was being threatened by the centralizing um, tendencies of this government, which wants to take back to itself repatriated powers from Brussels and not to give them to the devolved assemblies. Um, do you see that as being an internal problem within the United Kingdom? Well, certainly, I think the argument inside the British government about how to address Scottish independence, the threat of Scottish independence, um, has shifted quite dramatically away from uh, discussions that, of course, emerged in the, in, the, in the final weeks of the 2014 referendum in Scotland of a more co comprehensive offer on home rule and more devolution. And um, it's now moved towards actually more centralization. I think that rather than uh, the, the degree of government support for uh, federalism in the UK as a way of containing Scottish independence is diminishing quite rapidly. Um, and if they can um, find themselves in a situation where uh, support for the SNP is faltering at all in the next year or so, um, they will, I think, respond by trying to diminish powers uh, that are granted to Scotland, not grant more. And in fact, they've already done that under the terms of the Brexit arrangement, because a lot of the powers that were um, with Brussels are going to London, they're not going to Edinburgh. Yeah. Um, 
let's finish up talking a bit about the Labour Party and uh, other political parties than the Conservative Party. Um, I have the impression that um, that, that um, uh, Starmer thinks that uh, he was the leading QC um, in the case rationality against Brexit, um, but now that case has been lost and he's moving on to the next case. Um, why do you think that he and the Labour Party have been so quiescent? Um, um, and is it a, ta a tactic that they're going to um, find successful? Well, Starmer believes that the only way of recovering um, Labour Party support is to recover the, the seats in the North that were lost to the Conservatives because of the Brexit issue fundamentally. And therefore, that constrains any move to become a champion that opposes Brexit. And the question is whether that analysis is correct, because what has happened is that the Conservative Party is, has essentially occupied a large section of the political ground that was previously occupied by the Labour Party. Um, and the Labour Party is not, is not in a position to do a reverse on that in the South East and done it in London to a degree, but um, certainly not in the broader South East, which is where, um, from, for economic point, reasons, uh, opposition to Brexit will grow. And that's the, that's the problem that, that Starmer doesn't seem to have been able to, to get to. Also, there is the assumption that um, at the moment, uh, it's all too early to address this point because until the pain of Brexit bites, economically. Um, this will not be the dominant issue, and obviously it isn't the dominant issue at the moment with COVID. Um, but he's expressed the hope um, that Brexit won't be an issue in the next general election. Um, how plausible is that? Um, even if um, now is not the time uh, to be majoring on the um, uh, on, on on Brexit and opposition to it, is he really going to be able to get away with saying in 2024 or at a possibly earlier general election, well, it's done and dusted, it's not my fault, uh, we're just going to make it work? Do you think that will be good enough as a political narrative for his own party? Certainly not. I mean, the, 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 long, the, the longer this goes on, um, the the deeper will be and more obvious will be the economic damage that is done and the more strain will be put on the conservative vote in the south the question is whether there is also strain on the on the conservative vote in the north in this my feeling is that it probably won't be i mean that you've got a reversal going on that in some respects the, the labor party um has an opportunity to become what the Conservative Party was in terms of electoral coalition. And the Conservative Party is certainly already becoming what the Labour Party was in, in some respects. Um, World well turned upside down. Exactly. But whether Starmer himself is the right person to be able to um, achieve this shift and to um, come out of his current um, uh, Trappist approach to uh, the, the European issue, um, in time uh, to be credible? That is a rather different question, and I suspect probably not. Um, but of course, a lot depends on, on again, on timing here. It, if it is true that the Conservatives could contemplate an early general election, hoping that there's a strong global economic recovery, that they will be seen to have been able to benefit from um, their achievements in vaccination and the rest, that they could see themselves well placed towards the end of next year even um, then that, that I can see that temptation growing because there is absolutely no question that once COVID is over once the focus comes back onto economic performance the catastrophe of Brexit will become very very apparent. One last question what should individuals do in order to um, make it more likely that will rejoin the European Union sooner than would otherwise be the case? Well, I think clearly a force has to be created that can uh, impose a political cost on uh, whoever is not prepared to embrace the European, the pro-European and rejoin agenda. And that is going to put the focus again on the London and the southeast of England, because once 
the, the focus is put onto the economic cost of Brexit and the losers in those previously prosperous regions um, feel the pain. They will want that expressed. And the question is, if the Labour Party doesn't do that, will there be a force created that can impose a cost on, on that in the way that um, the anti-European cause are built on the pressures in the north of England and in the Midlands. Um, I think it's important to look at the UKIP parallel. Um, in 2000, nobody in UKIP knew how they would get the United Kingdom out of the European Union. Um, but they stuck with it and 15, 16 years later, they were rewarded. Um, I think it's very important um, that even if you can't see all the steps leading to rejoin, the goal should, should never be uh, abandoned because uh, that's the one we have been showing we will never rejoin if everybody throws up their, show, their hands and says, we can't rejoin. Well, one point I would make is, is the way in which within political parties, not the Conservative Party, but other political parties, um, I think individuals can press uh, for rejoin to be a part of, a greater part of the political prospectus of that party um, by making it clear, as did many Conservatives sympathetic to UKIP, that the, their vote for the Labour Party or the Greens or the Liberal Democrats is by no means guaranteed um, if they regard um, the um, uh, the leaders of those parties uh, as being insufficiently enthusiastic or, or, or reticent on the European issue. Um, UKIP worked from within the parties um, and I think that um, any rejoin movement should do the same. It's certainly incumbent on um, um, uh, voluntary organisations um, who aren't subject to the same constraints as Starmer feels himself to be, um, never to lose sight of, um, of rejoin as being not merely a distant goal, but a goal um, that is achievable uh, in, in a reasonable time frame. Um, it, it's not the city of God, it's a, it's a much more um, secular um, uh, uh, objective we have in rejoining the European Union. Thank you very much indeed, um, and perhaps we can continue our dialogue in the future at some time. Thank you very much, John.